These are things you can think about on a case-by-case -case basis as you go about your life. But whenever you engage in arrangements with people, uh, businesses or whatever it might be, it doesn't matter that there may not be a written contract. There probably is a contract in, in the legal definition, meaning an understanding between the parties, a quote-unquote meeting of the minds, which is what's required legally. And when there's that contract, then that's going to determine what the outcome is if there is a claim against you related to that transaction. So this has perhaps been a longer-winded way of making this point that needs to be made, but I hope that I communicate to you that, that there is a category on this laundry list. This category is called contracts, and, and it's a wonderful thing to consider when you're thinking about asset protection. I can't tell you how many lawyers or how many conferences I've been to where the, the issues of asset protection are being discussed, and, and they intend to cover the, the entire circle of considerations, and the discussion of, of, of the area of contracts generally is just not broached. It's because perhaps there's so much to talk about, so many more interesting, I guess, aspects of asset protection that this one often gets, gets lost, it's dropped between the cracks. But, but this is an area that, that you can attend to on a day-to-day -day basis. Just continually ask the question when you're engaged in relationships with others that have a business or a contractual aspect to it. Ask yourself, you know, what are the implications if this deal goes south? And, and maybe you don't know the answer to that, but then, then if it's something significant, you want to talk to a lawyer and find out. Uh, but this is a way to limit your risk. I, it should be toward the top of the list of asset protection considerations. What else can we talk about? We can talk about certainly trust. I would be amiss if, I, if, we, if we prepared a laundry list in which we didn't discuss trust. Now, in previous video casts, you know that, that whenever we're talking about asset protection, we're really talking about irrevocable trust. The irrevocable is not as spooky, perhaps, or, or ominous as it sounds. When you say irrevocable, it doesn't mean that you effectively always surrender complete control irreversibly. It may be that you, that you surrender partial control irreversibly. It may be that you, that you, can sit, that you uh, surrender complete control, but that it's not irreversible. I mean, there are a variety of conditions that you can bring to the table that do not invalidate the notion of an irrevocable trust. But, but you have to understand why irrevocable is a component of, of asset protection planning as it pertains to trust. The whole idea is that you've put something beyond your reach. That's the reason it's effective in the, as an asset protection strategy, is for you to say to the creditor, look, it's beyond my reach. There's nothing I can do. It's out of my hands. And yet you may still be a beneficiary of sorts. You may still benefit from that trust. And that's the real challenge when you're, when you're using irrevocable trust to think about asset protection is, how do I have my cake and eat it too? How can I make the good faith claim in a court of law that I have no, that I have no assets that, that were transferred to this trust, that they're beyond my, my control, my ownership, and at the same time have some benefits that you can take advantage of related to those assets? Seems like an inherent contradiction, doesn't it? But, but it can be done, and the, these cases have been upheld by courts throughout the land, but, but you do have to be careful in creating these, and these require highly skilled lawyers, lawyers who do a lot of this. You definitely do not want to go to a general practitioner and have them do the sort of asset protection planning that's required when you're doing it with trust. So while it's more complicated, it's more expensive, it also may be uh, perhaps the most effective among the things we talk about. I think I've said that as to every item on our list, haven't I? But in any case, this is huge. This is huge if you have a lot of assets to justify the transaction costs. You know, you're going to spend, I don't want to run you off, but it's not unusual to spend twenty to thirty thousand dollars if you're doing a an offshore trust. It's substantially less than that if you're doing a, a domestic trust. But you can see the numbers are significant. Then you have certain costs on an annual basis to, to maintain this trust. You have filings that have to be made, filings with the IRS, you probably have state filings, maybe you may have filings that have to be done annually in the in the country or the island where, where you have choose to have the, this trust based. So these are these are just costs. They can be two or three thousand dollars a year that you spend in maintaining it. So, so there, everyone I'm talking to I know is not a candidate for an offshore trust, and maybe not even a domestic trust, but, but it is something you should be aware of because they can be hugely beneficial. Uh, just a, a quick overview of, of, of why trusts are helpful and, and how they got that way. 
What the, the, the law in America has long been that you cannot create a trust, call called a self-settled trust. The law in America for a long time has been that you cannot create an irrevocable trust and then take refuge in it when a creditor comes along. And, doesn't that, and that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? It doesn't seem like fair play for you to be able to create this trust, put, put money in it, and you continue to be a beneficiary in, in some sense of the word, however indirect, and then you be able to say to a claimant, who's who, a good faith claimant, who's come to you and said, you owe me money, you have money, I want it, and, and if it's in the trust, I would want it from that source too, if need be. Um, only recently has the law began to recognize this notion of a self-settled trust, where it, it, it now is possible in a number of states, I think there are 10 or so states, this information may be on our website. If not, you can send us an email. And there are a number of sources where they, they keep track of these jurisdictions. But there are various states in the U.S. that have taken the position that, no, we think a self-settled trust can be done in a way that's not unfair to creditors. But we have certain rules. But if these rules are followed, followed then we will uphold a trust that someone creates and, and that that same person takes refuge in the trust when their creditors come after them. I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully when I'm describing a self-settled trust to distinguish it from a trust in which I create for someone else, I transfer the assets, and, and that other person may get sued. And, and it, it's certainly well settled that a claimant against that other person, though they're a beneficiary, does not have unfettered access to the contents of that trust. They're subject to the same limitations that the beneficiary is. And most jurisdictions also feel comfortable with the idea that I can create a trust in which I have no benefits, complete transfer of all control, and I create it for perhaps my children, for my spouse, whoever it might be. But the point is, I've surrendered complete control, and I'm not a beneficiary of this trust, and it's irrevocable. So under those circumstances, most jurisdictions are comfortable saying, okay, that, that's fair. So if a creditor comes along after the fact, this creditor didn't exist at the time you transferred the assets, creditor comes along after the fact and says that they want to access those in a lawsuit for some even legitimate claim. I can tell you that, that most jurisdictions are comfortable saying in the U.S., no, that those are gone. It's beyond the control. It's a transfer, just as if you had, had sold or given those assets away two years ago to your brother-in-law or some other, some other third party unrelated to your debt here, and it wasn't a fraudulent conveyance. But, but I, I do want to emphasize here that, that all jurisdictions are very, very sensitive to this issue of fraudulent conveyances. So whenever you are doing any of these transfers, it can't be when you have present, presently existing creditors. That the fraudulent conveyance statutes, there are federal laws, there are state laws, they are very emphatic and very punitive when that's the case. And interestingly enough, even in these foreign jurisdictions that are quite hospitable to doing um, at offshore asset protection planning. They're very hospitable to having these trusts there and they encourage it. They, they seek it. Their economy is based in part on the business that it produces. Even these places are not, do not welcome the sort of fraudulent conveyances uh, that some people would, would first run to a trust to do. When they've been sued, they have a judgment against them, someone's knocking at the door at the claim, then they decide to create this domestic or offshore trust. There, there's really no jurisdiction that welcomes that sort of business arrangement and that will protect it. So whenever we're talking about asset protection planning, we're really talking about planning before a, claiming, a claimant exists, not after the claimant exists. I can say a lot, a lot more about those rules, but I think that, that I've said enough for you to have this sort of red flag poised for anything that smells of a transfer after a claimant exists. Some of you may be thinking, well, gee, why else would you have it? Obviously, you, 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 you most want asset protection when you have the greatest urgent need for it. Well, maybe that's true and maybe it's not. I mean, the, the reality is that, that people who live in a risky environment can anticipate that. And, it's, and it behooves you and others who are in that situation to plan for the future, to be forward-minded, to be responsible. It's not responsible when you know risks exist, it comes down the road, a, a lawsuit's been filed, maybe even a judgment has been handed down, and then you decide that you're going to take these asset protection steps. No reputable lawyer is going to participate in that. They could lose their license, uh, there are all sorts of, of unpleasant things that could happen to them as a result of being involved in that sort of, of fraud, and that's what it's considered. So whenever we're talking about utilizing these trusts, I want you to think um, 
I want you to think prospectively about what your needs are. Now's the time when, you, when you're not in the, in the middle of that situation, when you don't have a malpractice suit against you, when you don't have someone who's fallen down in your parking lot who's suing you, 